All right, we'll uh, resume. We've got Joe straight from a mini conf that he himself is actually helping to run, so he's taking it out to uh, give us a uh, on the codec to. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, my name's David Rowe. Just rushed across from the Open Radio Mini Conf. We're building radios. Why aren't you all there? Oh, well. <laughs> uh, so, uh, today I would like to talk about some recent work I've been doing with Codec 2, an open source speech codec I've been working on for a couple of years. Um, I'll talk uh, just very briefly introduce the codec um, and the application for the codec I've been working on, which is digital voice over HF radio and why that's uh, special. Um, the mission I'm trying to achieve with this work, the goals, um, why it's pretty hard to get digital voice or voice at all over HF radio channels, uh, and then compare how existing legacy analogue radios do it and see what lessons we can learn from that. And then finally a demo. Okay, so Codec 2, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is an open source low bitrate codec. Uh, it fills a gap in codecs beneath 5,000 bits per second in the open source uh, landscape. Um, until recently, it was running between 1,200 and 3,200 bits per second. Um, and uh, recently, I've been playing with some lower bit rates, in particular for HF radio channels. Um, it's designed for speech only. This is not the sort of thing you use for MP3s. Um, it's communications quality speech, which means noticeable distortion in the coded speech, but quite intelligible. And you can usually recognise who's, who's on the other end of, uh, or who's doing the talking. So uh, the main application is digital radio. Um, I'm particularly interested in... Um, HF radio, otherwise known as shortwave, shortwave radio. Um, also, other possibilities of VHF, handheld, push-to-talk radio. Um, digital radio um, is important in that it can operate, in particular, HF radio without infrastructure. So without cell phone towers, networks, electricity, you can send uh, voice information over thousands of kilometres. Very useful if you're in the developing world or if uh, all the lights go out during a disaster. Uh, and several other applications as well. So this is a block diagram of what goes on in a digital voice radio system. Uh, we take a microphone signal, like the one I'm speaking to today, we sample it with an analogue digital converter. Uh, then we use the codec to compress it to a low bit rate, in this case in the range of 1200 to uh, 3200 bits per second uh, and beneath. Usually then we add some forward error correction. The idea here is we add some redundancy to those coded bits, um, such that if there is an error in the signal, we can correct uh, at the other end. And they, in these sorts of channels, they're not like the internet, there usually is plenty of errors. Uh, you can be dealing with error rates up to 10% of your bits may get through uh, in error. Uh, after forward error correction, it goes into a modulator. We convert the bits into modem tones that can be sent over an analog channel, in this case uh, a HF or VHF radio channel. Uh, the demodulator is on the other end uh, once it's come off the air, and that's got the job of picking the modem tones out of the noise and trying to reconstruct uh, a, a sequence of bits that we then error correct using the FEC decoder, the forward error correction decoder, and then pass on to the speech decoder, uh, which reconstructs uh, the analog speech via the D to A converter, and we, we hear what, what went in the other end. So they're the blocks that we're playing with for a, a digital voice over HF radio system. Okay, as I said, one of the great things about HF radio is no infrastructure and over thousands of kilometres. Um, so uh, that's got some particularly useful applications for humanitarian work, uh, the developing world, people who are travelling long distance. Um, my mission is to make digital voice work better than analogue. Um, HF radio is one of the few areas of electronic communications where the analog, incumbent analogue communication methods, such as single sideband, work better than digital. Um, digital's had inroads into just about everything else. Our mobile phones are digital. Digital TV, broadcast radio has gone digital. Uh, but what's left is um, HF radio. And that's because it's really hard and the existing analogue methods actually work really well, um, given the channel. Um, I'm looking at the area of what's called negative signal, uh, channel signal-to-noise ratios. The signal-to-noise ratio is a measure of how strong your signal is compared to the, the noise that the receiver is getting. Um, so we're looking into the negative area of channel signal-to-noise ratios now, which is really hard to do, but open source makes it easier. One of the reasons open source makes it easier is we now have control over various layers in the communication stack. Until recently, you had to go and buy a closed source codec from this guy, a modem from this guy, and then maybe a protocol from another guy and try to just hook these black boxes together. It was all closed, you had to take what they gave you, and uh, no choices or ability to experiment. But now with open source, we've got control. The modem's open source, the codec's open source. We can make our own protocols. We're not stuck with what other people 
um, say we have to use or what a vendor forces us to use. So we actually have some advantages over the incumbent systems in that we control all levels of the stack. Okay, this is called a spectrogram. It's like a 3D graph. Uh, along the bottom is time, so that's 10 seconds. It's actually a speech signal, a guy talking over HF radio, an analog speech signal going over HF radio. Up the left-hand side is frequency, 0 to 4,000 hertz. For um, this sort of application, we're only interested in communi communications quality and bandwidth, so typically 2,500 hertz of speech information will be sent over the channel. Now, this is analog information. What you can see is some... Um, my mouse is working here. No, is there a pointer? Oh, no, there we go. OK, so what you can see is, as this person's talking, you can see areas of light. The lighter it is, the higher the energy. So as we talk, we put a bit of energy in this part of speech, uh, then there's silence in between syllables, then there's some energy down here in a low frequency area, around 500 hertz. Um, a little bit later, we put some energy in the mid-range here, so we just do this automatically as we're talking. Our, the energy from our speech is distributed over frequency along this axis and over time as we speak. In between a sentence, there's silence. These three bars are actually clipping. We overloaded the transmitter and you get broadband noise, so they're sort of spurious but uh, interesting. Uh, um, and some other, there's, here's some other parts of speech here, once again, in, separated by silence. And even inside the speech signal at a particular point in time, you can see these gaps. Um, we're only putting speech energy into certain parts of the waveform. So what we're doing, and what evolution has basically done to our voice, is we're concentrating the energy we have from our lungs, going through our larynx and our vocal tract, into certain bands of frequency and time. And that gives it a really good punching power in a noisy environment. Um, so it's sort of an automatic allocation of energy across frequency and time to best transmit the message. Now, this might have been evolved for, you know, yelling in a noisy cave or screaming across a valley but it also works kind of well on HF radio. If you've got a given amount of transmit power, your voice automatically pumps energy into the regions that are most important for us perceiving the speech. This, on the other hand, is a, a digital modem signal going over a, a radio channel. So what we have here is, once again, time. It's 10 seconds of modem tones. You know, I'll play you in a moment what it sounds like, but you know, imagine a fax machine or an analog modem. Uh, and over here we have a bunch of modem signals. They're actually in what's called parallel tones. So there's, a, there's one here, another one here, another one here. You can see the bright bands. So we have multiple modem tones going across this channel. And the channel's wiping out bits of it. That's the nature of HF radio. It tends to blot out bits of it for a little while. Then it comes back, gets stronger, gets weaker. It's due to the, what's called multipath fading. And actually, the same, exactly the same thing happens with Wi-Fi, but it happens at 2.4 gigahertz rather than the high-frequency radio bands, which are in the, the 10 to 15 or 10, 3 to 30 megahertz band but you get this multi-path fading where things get dropping out. Now, the difference between this and the analog speech is that the modem power is continuous. We're allocating the same amount of power all the time to the speech signal, whether it's silence um, or not. So it's kind of a, a less efficient way of allocating power and something we have to overcome for digital speech systems. So just comparing analog and digital voice, um, for a start, analog has a lot of redundancy. If um, part of my wave, say the high frequencies of what I'm saying, get wiped out for a second or so by the channel, you're still pretty much going to work out what I'm saying. If you miss one word but get the next one, you're going to work out what I'm saying. So there's a fair bit of redundancy in human speech um, to start off with. Digital, on the other hand, we have some global bits. If you wipe out one bit in the codec, then it might sound like rubbish. The whole frequency spectrum might sound bad for a little while. Um, so it's perhaps a little less redundant. Um, in a digital system, different bits have different importance, a little bit like analog. Um, some bits, if they have an error, you won't be able to tell. Other bits will make a really big difference. There's also, typically in digital systems, there's um, memory or error propagation. If um, there's a bit error, say at second one, at second two, you might still be hearing the effect because that, uh, the effect of that bit error will propagate forward in time due to memory in the system. Um, in an analog system, what happens is you get this gradual decrease in quality with decreasing signal-to-noise ratio. So as the signal gets weaker at the receiver, you start having trouble hearing it, it gets noisier, but if you concentrate, you can still hear it, and gradually the intelligibility drops down into the noise and you lose it entirely. Digital systems tend to fall over. Uh, it'll sound really good once you get to a certain uh, receive signal to noise ratio, you'll get too many errors, bit errors, and the whole thing will just fall over. So it's less of a, uh, 
uh, a gradual decline and more of a knee in performance. Uh, as we indicated before, analog applies power fairly intelligently. Um, we've got so many watts to distribute and we, we tend to punch them in where they have the most effect uh, for, for human perception. Whereas digital just applies the same sort of power all the time, so it's a bit more wasteful. Okay, so my approach was to look at why the analog speech does work so well um, uh, when using analog speech over these bad HF channels. And one thing that um, people tend to do using HF radio is they start yelling into the radio, they repeat themselves, and they use things like the phonetic alphabet. So uh, down the bottom here is an example. If you're trying to send these, these letters, that's, that's my, my call sign, uh, you'll go Victor, Kilo, 5, Delta, Golf, Romeo, rather than VK5, DGR. What I'm doing there is spreading out that information in time. So I'm allocating more energy to each letter, if you like, slowing down the bit rate of what I'm saying. But I'm getting the message through. Getting some message through is better than none. So it's a little bit like variable bit rate coding, I'm, uh, but in an analog sense. I'm slowing down the information rate. And at the other end, we have this human forward error correction. If you know who I am and you've heard you know, these first two letters, you can probably guess what the rest is going to be if you've been talking to me for 10 minutes. Um, if you hear the start of one word and it's the English language, you're pretty sure what the end's going to be. So we have this uh, human forward error correction working for us. Um, so one of the reasons that analog SSB hangs on at these low signal-to-noise ratios is that we can, uh, as well as being fairly robust into the noise, we can also adapt uh, the coding rate, if you like. Okay, so the digital equivalent to that is lowering the codec bit rate. So I've said to myself, um, SSB, or single analog, the analog methods sound pretty bad at low signal-to-noise ratios. Let's make a codec that sounds really bad, but has a... Uh, a much lower bit rate and more chance of punching that message through. So I've tried to lower the speech quality right to the edge of intelligibility. Intelligibility is where I can't understand what's being said anymore. Or I might have to start repeating myself or using the phonetic alphabet, but I'll still get that message through. Um, so it's okay to repeat ourselves. It's okay if the speech quality is low. Um, but the benefit of a lower bit rate is it means uh, you get more power in each bit punching through. So a better chance of getting that signal decoded at the other end. Okay, so now I'd like to demonstrate what this actually sounds like uh, when we play. Uh, these are some real um, off at the start, real off-air recordings that we did recently. Okay, the first thing I'd like to show is um, the effect of uh, first of all the different coding rates. So I'll play the original speech um, before coding. Then I'll play it at uh, 1300 bits per second, and then at 450 bits per second. So first the original. W5ABC, here is uh, Victor Echo 9, Quebec Romeo Papa. My name is Bruce, Bravo Romeo Uniform Charlie Echo. I'm okay, now at 1300 bits per second. W5ABC, here is uh, Victor Echo 9, Quebec Romeo Papa. My name is Bruce, Bravo Romeo Uniform Charlie Echo. I'm and 450. Okay, so um, now we'll have a listen to some of the off-air signals. So these are the modem signals, what we're actually taking off the air off a radio and then trying to decode. Uh, here's the modem signal, at a, at, these are at fairly low 5 dB. There's a modem signal in there somewhere. That funny Donald Duck stuff at the top is an interfering station. But it's pretty much noise to the human ear, but still the modem can pick out a reasonable signal out of that. Um, the next one is what analog speech sounds like over that same channel. I've listened to that quite a few times, and all I can really get is the phonetic alphabet stuff at the, at the beginning. The rest is sort of lost in the noise. Now, this is what the digital signal sounds like. Uh, that 
same channel, once we take those modem signals that we couldn't quite hear, decode them uh, here. W5EBC is the Okay, so that's an example of the digital cliff. Um, it was going perfectly and then lost it and then came back again. But while it was working, it was noise free and you know, nailed the analog sample in terms of quality. Um, so I'll show you what's actually gone on there. So this is, um, oh, this is the software we use to listen to these signals off air. But that's the spectrum of the signal coming in. So that's a graph of amplitude off, along the left and frequency on the right. You can see the signal's not there, essentially. It's beneath the noise floor. Down the bottom is another a time plot. This is over 30 seconds versus uh, frequency down the bottom. And the intensity of the colour is how strong the signal is. You see it's being wiped out completely in this area. That was that bit where we lost it entirely. So the modem signal really did disappear into the noise, which is why we couldn't, we couldn't hear it. Um, and then suddenly it comes a bit stronger, we hear it for a while. Here is an area where it was pretty bad, but we still managed to decode it okay. Um, so that's a time sort of domain plot of what we're listening to. And that's actually um, the, the modem software I've got listening to these signals off air can estimate and plot the signal to noise ratio. So when we could hear the signal, it was up here, then we lost it completely and then it came back again. That's sort of typical of your, your HF channels. So that was why we couldn't hear it in the middle. Okay, that's the end of the talk. Happy to take questions. Any questions, no questions? Well, one question. Two. Oh, two. Oh. Uh, does your, um, like the codec and the forward error correction or both or between them take account of the characteristic of the multipath dropout by like spreading the bits out over time? Yeah, the FEC code spreads things out over um, several hundred milliseconds at this point. Unfortunately, with HF fading, the, the, it can be over seconds, and the trade-off with that is latency. You, know, you can't delay it too many seconds, or the guy at the other end will notice the, uh, you know, have to push the button, wait three seconds to hear something, for example. So there's a little bit of, that's called interleaving, there's a little bit of time domain interleaving there. Hmm. Yep. So um, I, I guess you're, you're targeting uh, lower bit rates than what already exists because there's already quite a few speech codecs like AMR, which is kind of proprietary, or speaks and Opus, which are yes, open. they're all sort of in the above five thousand kilobits per second yeah. range. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Which is a little bit too fast for digital radio. Yeah, because the bandwidth you take up would be too much, uh, and the you get poorer bit error rates. Consequently, realistically, do you ever think you do get lower than 400? Yeah, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's always a way you can go a bit further down. Yeah, and it, it's a trade-off with things like delay as well. Mm. Um, you mentioned that that normally codec two only goes down to 1200, and you've managed to. I just had a quick two-hour two hack session and uh, stripped off some extra information. What I intend to do in the release version of this is have some um, side information that will have the missing stuff. A good signal, you then pick up the uh, additional 800 bits per second and uh, you get the 1300 bits per second type quality out okay. of the codec. Yeah. So you get, sounds good when the channel's good, but you still get your message through when the channel's poor. Um, in terms of processing um, codec and decoder, like, how much do you need? Like, it doesn't take much in terms of compute power to handle the codec and decoder? No, not very much. Um, the smallest chip I've got it running on is a, a little microcontroller. It's using about less than 50% of the CPU of a 160 megahertz microcontroller. And I have, that's all C. There's no, I haven't optimised it or anything. Is that like a Cortex? Hmm, Cortex 4. Okay. Oh, cool. mentioned just before with the... Um to be able to hand off from the 450 to the eventually the 800 bit sort of bit rate. Is that a common practice to do variable bit rate sort of things or is that a new approach? I don't know over HF. A lot of that tends to be, as I said, because it's black boxes, you use this guy's codec and it tends to stick at the same rate. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, it's certainly common over higher bitrate codecs, but I'm not quite sure about the HF because uh, there's not much other open stuff going on down there. Yeah. So the the thing that I didn't get from the talk that I was kind of expecting from the beginning was, do you take into consideration in your codec encoding the way that the modem is going to convert it and encode it over and send it yes. over HF. Yes, several times I've gone back and iterated the codec to suit the channel and the modem. Okay, because it looked like, I mean, it was still pretty uniform on the plots and I was expecting it to be more kind of, kind of broken up a bit. Yeah, there is another version that I've been varying the analog transmit power of the modem based on the uh, input speech power of the speech signal. So if you look at a, like a scope plot, it looks just like a, uh, um, a variable power thing. Fooling with various different schemes at the moment. Hmm. All right, so if you don't... Oh, one more question. <laughs> uh, just, I guess, as a, a general question, um, the, the HF radio and the communica communications, it's still all real-time, as in, you know, five seconds of speech takes five seconds to transmit. Yes. Um, is sort of a, a, like a non-real-time communication something that you'd expect uh, might be worth looking into? Uh, possibly. There's applications for messaging and things like that. Yeah. All right. So, for joining me, thanking uh, David for coming over and giving us that talk.